From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Marion Davies and Brian Ahern in Peg of My Heart. Lux presents Hollywood. This is your program, ladies and gentlemen, made possible by your regular purchases of our products. It comes to you with the good wishes of our sponsors, who tonight bring you Marion Davies, Brian Ahern, Benita Hume, J. Farrell McDonald, Eileen Pringle, Gerald Oliver Smith, and Edgar Norton in Peg of My Heart. Our guests are Earl Johnson, famous trainer of motion picture dogs, and Marjorie Williams, director of the Hollywood Studio Club. Conducting our orchestra is Louis Silvers. And now, here's our producer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Marion Davies has given Hollywood two things for which the town may be thankful. A good fellowship, which has inspired so much loyalty, and a great white landmark on the ocean front, her home at Santa Monica Beach. A quiet little gathering there may mean from 30 to 1,000 guests and may include princes, giants of business, statesmen, and the nation's leading social lights, all being quite themselves under the spell of their charming and unassuming hostess. I've seen prominent ambassadors play ping-pong in the cellar, and a world-renowned scientist romping with Marion's four dachshunds. She's forbidden me to mention that she's active in a number of charities, so just pretend I didn't mention it. Aside from that, she grows hundreds of flowers and engages in the business affairs of Cosmopolitan Studios. Tonight... She plays a role in which she always excels. Peg in Peg of My Heart. Opposite her is that very resolute young man, Brian Ahern. For years, Brian struggled against becoming a star. It all began when, at the age of three, his mother practically thrust him on the stage. Brian showed his displeasure by howling throughout the entire performance. Still a rebel, he was enrolled in a London dramatic school at ten. His fellow students included an upperclassman, whom he recalls as a brash youngster with large ears and an assertive ambition. Once when Brian sent his autograph book to Reginald Owen, he found upon its return that the boy with the big ears had included his own signature. The uninvited autograph read, Noel Coward. Currently starred in The Great Garrick, you hear Brian on this stage as Sir Gerald Markham. Benita Hume comes to us as Ethel. J. Farrell MacDonald as Patrick Seamus O'Connell. Eileen Pringle as Mrs. Chichester. Gerald Oliver Smith as Alaric and Edgar Norton of the original stage cast as Jarvis in the Lux Radio Theatre production, Peg of My Heart, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. A fishing village off the west coast of Ireland. A narrow cobbled street runs the length of the waterfront, where a score of tiny fishing boats bob merrily at anchor. One of these bears the painted legend, Peg of My Heart. On its slippery deck, Patrick Seamus O'Connell empties the day's catch into baskets. His daughter, Peg, in boy's clothing, lends a willing hand, tossing the baskets into a donkey cart. Yes, sure, the cart is piled full, Father. Hold one more, I'm thinking. Here you be. Oh, sure, and there was a grand catch we had today, wasn't it, Father? I've seen more fishes in my lifetime. Go along with you now and be taking them up to the icing station and then go home and get supper. Sure, Father. Now, where's Michael? Michael, me lad. Here, boy. Oh, 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 there you are. Up on the cart with you now. Go on up, you go, and mind. Don't step on the fish. Goodbye, Father. Is it long you'll be? No longer than it takes the nets to dry. Your supper will be wet, then. Get up, sweetheart. Get up. There's a light in your eyes, sweetheart, darling. Boy, boy. I say, boy. Whoa. Is it me you're talking to, mister? Yes, I am. Uh... Oh, who is it then that you're calling, boy? Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I thought, uh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> sure, there's no harm done. Be like it with me, past the cost of mistakes. <laughs> yes, I imagine so. And what can I be doing for you? Uh, well, I've just come from London. I'm looking for a Mr. O'Connell. Patrick Seamus O'Connell. Are you now? Well, that'll be him down there on the deck of the peg of me heart. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> oh, no trouble at all, lad. Get up, sweetheart. Get on with you. Get on there. Oh, 
Good evening. It is that. Were you looking for someone? Are you Mr. O'Connell? I am. Patrick Seamus is the name. Ah, then you're the one I want. Uh, you married Heather Kingsnorth, didn't you? I did. But she's been gone these 14 years. Uh, yes, I know. Uh, my name is Gerald Markham. I'm the executor of the King's North Estate. I suppose you knew that your wife's father was dead. I did not. When did they hang him? <laughs> I'm happy to say that Mr. King's North died in his bed, like an honest English gentleman. And of a very common ailment, old age. Uh, you'll be pleased to learn that his granddaughter, your daughter Margaret, inherits his entire estate. What's that? Squire King's North has left your daughter two million pounds. Two million pounds? Holy saints. Of course, there are certain conditions. Oh, of course there would be. What conditions? Well, first, Miss O'Connell will have to spend three years with the Chichester family. Who? Uh, Mrs. Chichester is a distant relation of the King's North. And she'll stay with them? For three years. Hmm. Be the way of making a lady of her, I suppose. Well, let's call it education. Uh-huh. Hmm. Well, it will do Peg no harm. There's maybe one or two things I couldn't teach her myself. <clears throat> but mind you, I'll not live with Mr. Ch Chichester. Oh, no, 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 of course not. Uh, as a matter of fact, the second condition states that you are not to be with your daughter. Oh, does it? Not to be with Peg for three years? It's more than that, Mr. O'Connell. The separation is to be complete and permanent. Permanent? That's forever, ain't it? Yes. I have a paper here that you ought to sign. You can keep your paper, Mr. Markham, and your conditions with it. And you can take yourself off this boat as fast as your legs can carry you. Go on. Oh, wait, please. Uh, these aren't my conditions, Mr. O'Connell. I'm only acting as, uh, well, uh, as a messenger, you might say. And it's sorry news you're bringing, too. I'll have none of it. I can understand your attitude. But um, do you think that you're being quite fair to your daughter? I do, that. She's happy here, and I'm happy, too. I don't... Glory be. They're ringing the bell again. What does it mean? Has something happened? Aye. David! David Cork! Aye, Patrick. Who was it, David? What's the miss? Danny Fogarty's boat, the Sheila. She went down off the reef. All hands lost. <laughs> All hands lost. Glory be. And himself leaving behind a widow and child. It's a sad day for them, I'm thinking. It might have been you, Mr. O'Connell. What's that? What's that you're saying? I say it might have been you. What would happen to your daughter? Aye. Aye. You're right, Mr. Markham. Well? I... I never... I never never gave it a thought before. You'll come to the house tonight, Mr. Markham? We'll... We'll talk it over then. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, Father. Father! Eh? Your supper be as oh. cold as a clam. I'm sorry, Peg. I... Uh, I was thinking. Is there something on your mind, Father? You've been acting mighty strange, you have. Oh, it is nothing much. I... I... I was only thinking that it's... It's mighty little pleasure you have in this life, Gerald. Me? Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, uh, living... Living this kind of a life uh, with an old man... You must be getting tired of me. Tired of you? What talk have you? I'd not change you for a million pounds. Ah, but would you change me for two million pounds? I would not. Not for all the money in the world. Oh, Peg, darling. Yeah. <laughs> sure, it's a great mistake to be making, too, holding on to an old man like me when you might be hobnobbing with all the lords and ladies of London. Father, are you daft? What talk is this? Peg. Peg, dear. There's something I... Now, who's that? The latch is off. Let you be coming in. Oh, good evening. Oh, come in. Come in, Sir Gerald. Oh, thank you. Sir Gerald. Oh, thanks, preserve us. And be talking to him this day like he was my own equal. <laughs> <laughs> this is my daughter, Peg, Sir Gerald. Oh, how do you do, Peg? Pleased to meet you, Your Honor. I mean, <laughs> Your Highness, I'm, I don't know what I mean. <laughs> What's good is here, girl? Well, it's a great honor to meet a Sir... Uh, Sir Gerald, sir. Oh, not really. There are baronets all over in England, thicker than plums in a pudding. We never had a plum pudding, Your Highness. That's true enough. But you will now, Peg. Sit down, Sir Gerald. Thank you. Father. Father, what is it? You're an heiress, Peg. Oh, what? An heiress. Squire King's not that died, he has. And he left you all the money you want. And, and everything that goes with it. Two million pounds, to be exact. Two million pounds? Ah, take it, I 
right now. And it's all yours to spend as you want. Ah, then I'll be getting you the red flannel that they've been leaning against your cart the next winter. And I'll buy a brass collar for Michael with his name written on it. And a dress for myself. Uh, uh, maybe two dresses. And some new boots to go fishing in. You'll not be going fishing. It's in England you'll be living. England, is it? And when do we go? You made it. You must be getting about your packing, Peggy. It'll be the morning train you're leaving. Oh, glory be. Then yourself had best be packing, too. Uh, never mind about me. I'm not going with you. Not going? Then I'm not going either. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not going with you just now. And why not? Why, uh, oh, you see, there's, there's this and that to be attended to. and. Well, uh, uh, when will you come? Mm, it will not be so long. But when? Well, uh, soon. All right. But you'll be coming or I'll, I'll be coming back and that's flat. Go on now and attend to your packing. Will, uh, will you be staying, Your Honor? Well, just for a moment. I'll see you the first thing in the morning. Good night, then. And thank you, Your Honor. You're not being fair to her, Mr. O'Connell. Do you think she'd go if she thought she'd never be seeing me? It's the only way. What are you going to do? I'll write her I've been delayed. And then what? I'll write her again. And after that? Oh, I'll write... I, uh, I'll write her I'm dead. That is, I'll have somebody write her I'm dead. That's hardly a solution. It's worse than telling her now. But even if she would go, which she wouldn't, could break both our hearts, the pattern. It's breaking yours now. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm much older, and I'm, I'm used to it. And and here's your bundle. And here's your grip. Are you ready now? All ready, Father. The cart's waiting, Peg. In a minute, Sir General. <laughs> and here's Michael. You'll be taking him, too. Get up on the cart, Michael. Oh, Father. Well, well, girl. Father, I... I can't say goodbye. We'll not be mentioning them. <laughs> and, and we'll not be crying, either, will we, Peg? No, I... I'll not be crying. Sure, what's there to cry about? Nothing. Nothing. It's, t- it's a very happy, happy occasion. Me cold is a little worse this morning. So was mine. It's come on me all of a sudden. All ready, Mr. O'Connell? Coming. Oh, Father, call me that name again so I'll feel warm till you come for me. Call me your name for me. Peg. Peg me heart. Oh, Father. Now go out. Go on. Drive on. Drive on. Quick, Sir Gerald. Goodbye, Mr. Connell. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, Peg. Goodbye. Goodbye, Goodbye. Goodbye Father. All right, Peg, this is it. You mean this is the house for down to stay in? Of course. Come on. Oh, glory be. Shoot is large enough for a regiment, horses and all. <laughs> oh, you'll get used to it. Here we are. Oh, thanks above. Look at the knocker. Sure, they're mighty careful at the knuckles in England, aren't they, Your Honor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Are you tired, Peg? Dibble a bit. Let's start now for somewhere else, Your Honor. Timbuktu, for instance. Oh, you're not nervous, are you? No, not a bit. Uh, that's why I can't understand why my knees is knocking. <laughs> Oh, uh, good morning, Jarvis. Oh, good morning, Sir Gerald. Come right in, Peg. Thank you. Uh, n- nasty day, sir. Hmm, storm coming on, I think. Uh, yes, sir. You'll find the family in the drawing room. Sir. Thanks. This way, Peg. We might have well been there. Hello. Oh, Sir Gerald. Hello, Jerry. Hello. Hello. Come right in, Peg. Uh, this is your aunt, Mrs. Chichester. I'm pleased to meet you, ma'am. I'm sure. <laughs> How do you do? Huh? And uh, this is Miss Ethel Chichester and Mr. Alaric Chichester. How do you do? How do you do? Hello. Um, what did you say your name was, young lady? I didn't say, but it's Peg. And this is me dog, Michael. Uh, say hello to the lady, Michael. <laughs> stop it, stop it, Jarvis. Jarvis. <laughs> Call him off, you dear. Call him off. Down, Michael. Down, boy. Uh, <laughs> sure. He was only trying to be friends, ma'am. You called, madam? Yes, I did. Take that dog away. Oh, no, ma'am. Not Michael. You can't take Michael away from me. He was given to me by my father. Take it away. And never let it inside the house again. Well, if you don't want Michael inside the house, you don't want me inside the house. Peg, please, let's not have an argument. I'm not having an argument. I'm making a statement. 
I don't know these people two minutes, and they want to take me dog away from me. Well, you must try to do whatever your aunt asks you. Now, let him go, Peg. You can see him whenever you want to. Well, is he going to be in the house? Oh, of course he is. All right, then. Take him, Jarvis. Yes, madam. You'll be very nice to him, won't you? Yes, miss. And give him a mutton bone. He loves mutton bones. Certainly, miss. Goodbye, Michael. I'm sure he'll be well taken care of, Peg. Well, he'd better be. That's all I have to say. Come here to me. Yes, ma'am. And don't call me ma'am. No, ma'am. Aunt, I mean. Aunt, not aunt. Yes, ma'am. Sit down, please. All right. Thank you. I said sit, not sprawl. Look at your cousin Ethel. Me cousin Ethel? Oh, her. Is she me cousin? Yes, I hope you have no objections. Oh, not the least. Now, Margaret, what I would like to... Uh... Margaret. <laughs> my name ain't Margaret. My name is Peg. That's only a corruption. We shall call you Margaret. All right. But don't forget if I forget the answer. Don't blame me, will you? Me father always calls me Peg. We have very little interest in what your father calls you. You will kindly leave him out of the conversation. Then it's all I will leave him out of... No temper, if you please. You are here to learn how to conduct yourself. You may go to your room now, Margaret. Jarvis will show you the way. Margaret. Oh, it's me, you mean. <laughs> now, there you are, Aunt. <laughs> you see, when you didn't say a pig, I... Never do. Go to your room, please. Very well, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Well, a nice package you've delivered, Sir Gerald. Oh, she's not so bad. She's really very sweet. You'll have to be patient with her for a while, that's all. Patient? Oh, it's going to take more than patience to make anything of her. Oh, I say, Ethel, don't be so hard. After all, you know we are being paid for it. <laughs> Am I right, Jerry? Quite right, Alaric. I, um, I imagine you might be able to use the additional income. Use it? Oh, <laughs> well, I think that's very good. That's really amusing. Especially since we have no other income. Alaric, don't be vulgar. Well, it's too humiliating to be paid for keeping someone in the house. Well, of course, she's not to know that. She's a guest here, and she has to be treated as one. Well. Hey, was that Tamba? I, I see, uh, Mrs. Chichester. Well, Jarvis, is, is the young lady the same, Mrs. Chichester? Of course she is. Well, I unpacked her things, madam, but she's packed them again, and she's on her way out. What? Where is she? Which way did she go? She's the back way. I think we've got to stop her. I'll get her. Wait no, here. There you are. I knew we'd go over now. Hey! Hey, where are you? It's only a summer storm. Oh, sure, in summer or winter, they shrivel me up. Oh! Stop it now. Get a grip on yourself. I can't. When I hear the great crashes of thunder, I remember all my sins. Sit down. Go on. Sit down. There, now. It's all over. Oh, thank heaven for that. Where were you just going? I was going out, I was. Out of this house and back to me father. Oh, but you can't do that, Peg. Oh, yes, I can. I'm not wanted here. That is, it is he. Oh, but you are wanted, Peg. I, uh, I happen to know. And who is it wants me? Not old Mrs. Chichester. And not my cousins either. Them with their sour faces. I'm not used to sour faces, I'm not. Well, then, I want you to stay. Will you do it for me, Peg? You? Oh, Your Honor. You've been very kind to me, you have, and that's the truth. But they're not going to make a lady out of me if I can help it. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. That's what my father says. And that's what I am. A sow's ear. I don't agree with you, Peg. I don't care whether you do not. I'm a thousand well, I am. if you insist. Thank you. But you're going to stay? Well, uh, seeing as it's you who's asking me, Your Honor. It is. And you mustn't call me Your Honor. My name is Jerry. Jerry? Do you want me to call you Jerry? Well, why not? We're friends, aren't we? Oh, yes, but, uh, but we're not as good friends as all that. <laughs> well, we will be soon. You're very sure? I'll stake my life on it. Would you now? <laughs> then you don't value it much. Oh, yes, I do. Perhaps more than I ever did before. Margaret? Margaret? Oh, oh glory be it herself. I see. Here she is, Mater. Margaret, where were you going? Sure, and I was going out, I was. But it changed my mind now because only Jerry here asked me to. Margaret? Jerry? Oh, I say. But why shouldn't I call him Jerry? He's my friend, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> We have just heard Act One of Plague of My Heart. In just a few moments, we will continue with Act Two of our play, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. But now it's intermission time in the Lux Radio Theater. While we are waiting for Act Two, we want you to go with us to an attractive home in Westwood. There we meet an important Hollywood lady, one of our few women executives. She's settling down for a visit with her sister, just arrived from the East for a month's stay. Now, Lou, tell me all about it. How does it feel to be a married woman? Oh, just wonderful, sis. Harry's an angel. You'll love him. <laughs> Will I? Oh, yes, he's the most perfect husband. Mm, praises your biscuits. Men's broken chairs. Tens the furnace, I suppose. Does he wash dishes, too? Oh, certainly not. I'm the chief cook and dishwasher in our house. 
Well, your hands don't show it. I'll say that. Of course they don't, sis. I'm very particular about the way I wash dishes. I never use anything but Lux Flakes. I've heard so much about Lux around the studio, but I don't know much about dishwashing. Is it so wonderful for that, too? It is wonderful, sis. Well, I've been washing dishes for months, and my hands haven't once felt the teeniest bit rough or chapped. They say Lux hasn't any of the harmful alkali that some soaps have. That's why it doesn't dry your skin. Your hands really are nice, Lou. Nice enough to kiss. And tell me, honest now, doesn't Harry... Yes, he does, silly, and I hope he'll always want to. And now, let's go back to our play. Mr. DeMille sets the scene for us. We continue with Peg of My Heart, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern with Benita Hume. One month has passed since Peg first came to the Chichester home. A month of training and study that's been all work and no play. In the living room, we find Ethel and Christopher Brent, a friend of the family. Brent has been a frequent visitor, and Peg has come to know him and to dislike him intensely. He's just been shown in by Jarvis. And coming quickly across the room, takes Ethel's hand. Ethel, how are you, darling? Oh, I'm all right. Glad to see me. Mm-hmm. Why not? Where is everybody? Mother's lying down and Eric's around someplace. And your little Irish cousin? Oh, my little Irish cousin. You seem very interested in her. <laughs> Child amuses me. Are you sure that's all? Oh, Ethel, please. I refuse to be drawn into an argument about anything so ridiculous. I'm sorry, Chris. It's just nerves. Things have been rather trying this past month. Yes, for me too. Ethel, I'm at the crossroads. What do you mean? And it's the end between me and my wife. We quarreled again last night about you. Oh, how interesting. She's heard some talk about us. She put the worst construction on it naturally. And what do you intend doing? Separate, of course. She won't give me a divorce. But I'm leaving for France tonight. Alone? Yes, unless someone goes with me. Oh, naturally. Ethel. If my wife does set me free, will you marry me? I... I don't know, Chris. I want you, Ethel. I need you. Mm, until you grow tired of me, as you're tired of your wife? I'll never grow tired of you. I love you, Ethel. You know that, don't you? Don't, Chris. Why not? No, no, please. Darling, I... I... Hello. Oh. Oh, don't mind me. I was told to come down here and study. And was it absolutely necessary to choose this room? Well, it's as good as any other, I guess. But I won't be in your way. I'll just sit off in the corner and you'll never even know I'm there. Chris, Oh, it's, I... it's quite all right. I, I was just about to leave anyway. Oh, were you? Well, I hope you're not leaving on my account, but uh, goodbye, Mr. Brent. Goodbye. Who is it? May I come in? Oh, what do you want? Oh, just to say good night. It's a nice room you have, Ethel. Well, I'd feel terrible if it didn't meet with your approval. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, aren't you my model? Oh, good night, please. Oh, Ethel, please don't be angry with me. I didn't mean it, Ethel. Ethel, won't you make friends with me? We have nothing in common. Well, that doesn't prevent us from being decent to each other. I'll meet you three quarters of the way if you'll only show one generous feeling toward me. You would if you knew what was in my mind. <laughs> You're a strange creature. Ah, oh, you got us mixed up. I'm not the strange one. What? Oh, I watch and listen. And listen to you. You turn your face to the world as much as to say, Oh, I die the ears ago, and sweet-tempered, calm young lady. And you're not quite that, are you? Well, what am I? Of course. You've got the breed and then the beautiful manners. But you have a temper. And it's a beautiful temper. It's a shame for you not to let it out in the daylight so that everybody can see it. But you can't, can you? Because it's not good form. And with all your fine advantages... You're not very happy, are you? Are you? No. Neither am I in this house. Ethel, I'd like very much to ask you something. Well, what is it? Do you know anything about love? What? Have you ever been in love? Well, no, I haven't. Have you ever thought about it? Um, what do you think about it? Very little. Oh, you're wrong. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. To love a good man who loves you. A man who makes you hot and cold. Burning like fire one minute. And freezing like ice the next. Who makes your heart leap with happiness when he comes near you? And ache with sorrow when he goes away from you? Oh, it's mighty disturbing. Well, how do you know all this? Oh, I, uh, I read about it in a book. Oh, I see. Don't you like men, Ethel? Not much. But you like Mr. Brent, don't you? Certainly I do. He's a very old friend of the family. 
He has a wife. Well, what about it? Oh, nothing, Ethel. But tell me this. Is it customary for English husbands to go around kissing other women? I suppose you're referring to what you saw downstairs today. Well, in a way, uh, yes. Will you kindly have the decency to keep your observations to yourself? Oh, sure, please, Ethel. Don't be angry with me. I only wanted to tell you something. I don't care to hear it. Now go away. And just for a change, try minding your own business. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Jerry! Is it you? Oh, hello, Peg. Hello. Sit down, Jerry. Oh, can't stay. Just dropped in to ask you something. Yes? Well, there's a dance tonight at the country club. Would you like to go? Would I like? Oh, indeed I would. <laughs> Good. We'll have to ask your aunt, of course. Ah, uh, would we? Oh, but she'll never let me, Jerry. Oh. She won't, I know. Oh, don't let's take any chances. Let's go to the dance tonight, and I'll ask her tomorrow oh, morning. Peg, well, that's not fair. I know, but it's a dance. And if you think I'm going to let it get by me, you're very much mistaken. <laughs> when the lights are all out and they're all asleep, I'll creep down the stairs and meet you at the foot of the path. And if it goes against your tender conscience to take me, I'll take you. <laughs> That's how we'll settle that. <laughs> oh, but there may not be any occasion to do any such thing. Your aunt may be delighted. Delighted? <laughs> sure. She doesn't know the meaning of the word. But why shouldn't she let you go? After all, I'm an old friend of the family. And, uh, well, we're good friends, too. Aren't we, Peg? I... I guess we are, Jerry. Did you ever hear what Tom Moore wrote about friendship? No. Would you like to hear what Tom Moore wrote about friendship? I'd love to. All right. There's a tune that goes with it, but I won't sing the words. Why not? Well, it wouldn't be fair to Tom Moore. <laughs> it's about a girl, that is, who built a shrine, and she thought that the best thing in the world to put in it was an image of friendship. You see... She was like you. She thought that there was nothing in the world as nice as friendship. Yes? Yes. And this is what happened to her. She flew to a sculptor who sat down before her. A friendship the fairest his art could invent. But so cold and dull that this useful adorer said plainly, that was not the friendship she meant. Oh, never, she cried. Could I think of enshrining an image whose looks are so joyless and dim? But yon little Cupid... Miss Rose is reclining. We'll make, if you please, sir, a friendship of him. So the bargain was struck with a little god laden. She joyfully flew to her shrine in the grove. Farewell, said the sculptor. You're not the first maiden who came but for friendship and took away love. Now, where in the world did you learn that? Oh, my father taught me that. Tom Moore's my father's prayer book. Who came but for friendship and took away love. Well, that's happened to a lot of men, I think. To a lot of women, I think. Has it ever happened to you, Peg? To me? Uh, well, no. Uh, maybe it would sometime if... Oh, if I was different. But, oh, I'm just an Irish nobody. Oh, don't say that. Oh, I'm sure there's a little something good in me. But the bad little something always beats the good little something out, so it does. Well, you'll have to put a rain on the bad something, then. <laughs> so I will. But would you mind very much... If it had just one more spurt before I killed it altogether. What do you mean? <laughs> I want to go to the dance. It's the last bad thing I'll ask you to let me do. I behave like a saint from heaven after that. Well, I still think you should ask your aunt. All right, I will then. But yes or no, I'm going to that dance. <laughs> Happy? Sure, the whole world's going around with this one waltz. And I'm going around with it, too. I'm dizzy, I am. Shall we sit down? Ah, oh, no, it'll be over so soon. An hour more, and I'll be creeping back like a thief in the night. You shouldn't have come here, really. Don't I know it? And isn't that why it's such fun? <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. Oh, yes, here we are. Sure, it's been a glorious night, Jerry. I'm glad, Peg. All the while I'm supposed to have been asleep upstairs, I've been stealing the time. I'm a thief, I am. Well, you're a lovely thief. The sweetest. What? You'd better go in. I know that. But what, what are you going to say to me? Something it might be better to say in daylight. But why in the daylight? 
with a beautiful bright moon so high in the heavens. I do I know. Someone may hear us. Oh, I suppose you do know best, but that's a magnificent moon. Well, good night, Jerry. Good night, Peg. Jerry. What is it? I I heard something. There's someone over there by the tree. Do you see him? Yes. It looks like Bradley. Bradley? Who's he? Christopher Brent's chauffeur. Oh, of course it is. That's Brent's car at the end of the drive. Now, what's he doing here at this hour? Sure, and I think I have a very good idea. Good night, Jerry. Peg, wait. I can't. I can't. I've got to go in. Good night, Jerry. Good night, Peg. Who's there? Is, is that you, Ethel? What are you doing down here in the dark? I could ask the same of you. What are you doing with your hat and coat on at this time of the night? And a traveling chase with you, too. Go to your room, please. What are you going away? Keep your voice down. Mr. Brent's car is out there. Were you going away with Brent, were you? Answer me, Ethel. Yes, I am. We're taking the boat to France. Oh, no, you're not. You're not going out of this house tonight. If I have to wake everyone in, it will wake them. They can't stop me. Nothing can stop me now. And what do you suppose you'd be going to? Awake and asleep in purgatory, sure. Get out of my way. He has a wife, Ethel. He hates her. And I hate this. Is it my fault she won't give him a divorce? And is that what he told you? And did you believe it? It's him that won't get the divorce. He wants her money. And he wants you. And he can't have both without lying to you. You're mad. It's the truth, I'm telling you. You've got to believe me, Ethel. You'll leave me alone. No, you're not getting in the car tonight. And I'm the one who'll see to it. Come back here. Come back. Bradley. Bradley. Good evening, Miss Ethel. It's not Miss Ethel. Where's Mr. Brent? Why, well, he's at the Boar's Head Tavern, Miss, but... Uh... Is he waiting for her? Well, Miss, I... I... Then you can take me to him. But Miss Ethel... No, Miss Ethel ain't coming. Now get in there, drive. Go on before I blacken your two snaky eyes. Yes, Miss. Who is it? Is it you, Ethel? Ethel, why don't you... Oh. You can close the door, please. What are you doing here? I came to see you, Mr. Brent. Yes, that's obvious. There must be some other explanation. Won't you sit down? Oh, no. I can tell you what I think of you standing on my own two feet. Really, now? And I'll thank you not to interrupt me. It'll take me a long time, it will, thinking up bad words enough to describe the likes of you. Yes. Oh, uh, come in, Ethel. We have a visitor. I oh. thought she'd be here. You may go now, please. And leave you to go gallivanting off with this parlor snake? Oh, no. I came here to tell him what I think of him. And I'm staying here till I've finished. You stay out of my business. Oh, what is a snake I called you, Mr. Brent? Well, you're worse than a snake and a whole foot lower. A decent girl wouldn't lower herself to step on you. But you fooled Miss Ethel here, and now you're going to tell her the truth. Did you hear what I said? Get out. Oh, let her alone, Ethel. She's very amusing. The whole situation is amusing. Chris. Quiet. <laughs> amusing, is it? Well, then why don't you answer the door? Here. Don't let them hear you. Ethel, get into the other room. What? Go on, I can take care of this. What are you going to do? Go on now, please, go on. Come in, sir. Are you mad? Is this him, Mrs.? Yes. Good evening, Chris. Oh, how do you do, Claire? Oh, Claire, is it? Yes, Claire Brent. I'm Mr. Brent's wife. I, uh, I don't believe I know the two gentlemen, Claire. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Doyle and Mr. Flint. Detectives. They didn't come to pay a social call. Well, have you gentlemen seen all you wish? I think it'll do. It'll stand in any divorce court. Thank you. Claire, you can't do this. What's your name, young lady? Don't answer them. And why not? I'm not ashamed of it. My name's Peg O'Connell. Thank you. Is that all, gentlemen? That's all. Good night, Chris. Well, that's that. I suppose you know what you've done, Miss O'Connell. Yes, Mr. Brent. I've shown you up for what you are. Ethel, you can come out now. Peg. Oh, Peg. Well, there now, it's all right. Everything's all right. But it isn't. Not for you, it isn't. Don't you understand? The newspapers, they'll name you as a correspondent. They'll think that you are the one who is... Oh, let them think what they want. There's only two people in this whole wide world I care a hang about. One of them is my father. Oh, he'll know it's a lie. And the other one... He'll believe whatever is in his heart to believe. Oh, now I think we'd best be getting home. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Down comes the curtain on Act Two of our play, starring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. One of the characters in our play is a four-footed gentleman named Michael. And for the next moment or two, before going into Act Three of Peg of My Heart, we'll hear about Michael's Hollywood relations, the dogs of motion pictures. I don't know what a dog's vision of paradise may be, but Hollywood comes pretty close to being a canine heaven. The home of practically every star has two or three tail waggers. Many of our celebrities raise prize dogs as a hobby. Charlie Ruggles raises them as a business. And here you'll find catering shops, dude ranches, haberdashery stores, beauty parlors, and expert medicals, all dedicated to a happy, healthy Fido. Our guest, Earl Johnson, has trained motion picture dogs for many years, including Flush, whom you saw in the Barrett of Wimple Street. His most famous star is the German shepherd, Lightning, hero of such films as Wings in the Dark, The Case of the Howling Dog, and White Fang. And now, Mr. Johnson, just what does it take to be a Clark Gable in dogdom? Same two qualities, Mr. DeMille, the human stars must have. Intelligence and personality. Lots of dogs could be taught to do everything that lightning does. But his success is due chiefly to the personality he exhibits in doing his tricks. In the days of silent pictures, when a dog was playing a scene, all a trainer had to do was speak commands. This, of course, can't be done in talking pictures. How, then, do you convey to a dog what you want him to do? Well, before a scene is shot, the dog is rehearsed, just like any other member of the cast. But naturally, when the scene is being played, the dog can't understand the dialogue, so he must get his direction from the trainer. The trainer stands near the camera and tells the dog exactly what to do through certain simple movements of his hands. But does Lightning know when he's acting and when he isn't? Yes. He'll attack a man and rip his clothing to shred and perform with all the viciousness of a wolf. As soon as the scene is finished... He'll run up to the same man, wag his tail, and lick his hands like a puppy. And he'll never let his teeth so much as scratch the skin of the man he's attacking. All that, of course, being the result of careful training. A dog's career in motion pictures is much the same as a man's. If he's to get an important part, he must pass a screen test. I tested 11 dogs before I found Lantloper, the can terrier who performs in the Buccaneer. <laughs> he even walked the plank for me. Yes, famous dogs like that. Have their own dressing rooms. Their own doubles and stand-ins and receive hundreds of fan letters. Lightning's stand-in is his own son, Lightning Jr., who's learning the picture business in that manner. And if a dog has a feature part in a film, he's hired like any other important player to the casting office. If he's an extra, so to speak, he's hired to the property department. What can you tell us about Lightning's rival for screen popularity, the wirehead terrier Mr. Astor, who appears with William Powell and Myrna Loy in the Thin Man pictures? Mr. Astor is owned by Henry East. The dog's real name is Skippy. And you'll see him again in the new film, The Awful Truth. This time under the name of Mr. Smith. Skippy is undoubtedly one of the smartest dogs ever seen in films. In his fondest possession, though he's received many more valuable gifts from the stars with whom he's worked, is a little rubber mouse named Oslo. Mr. East gives Oslo to Skippy to chew on whenever he's shot a particularly good scene. I confess I'm having a little difficulty with Josephine DeMille, our St. Bernard. Josephine doesn't always want to sit down when she's asked to. Well, here's a good way to teach Josephine, or any other dog, to sit down on command. Put your dog on a leash at your left side. Hold the leash taut in your right hand. With the other hand, stroke the dog's back. Move your hand down his back to a spot where the hindquarters connect with the spine. At this point, there's a reflex nerve. When your hand passes over it, Press down a little with your finger and thumb. The dog will automatically sit down. While you're doing this, just tell the dog to sit. As he does it, give him a pat on the head. Try it again a few seconds later. Keep repeating the process until the dog learns to associate the word with the action. The most complicated trick is based on the same simple association. Keep commands short so as not to confuse him. And remember, the secrets of obedience are patience and kindness. A good idea. But Josephine's one drawback is that she usually bites the hand that pats her. <laughs> well, I know. I'll have to send Lightning over to teach her some manners. Of course, everything Lightning does is not exactly a trick. Lightning has a lot of plain common sense. And just to prove that, I brought him along tonight. Lightning... Say hello to Mr. DeMille and all the listeners. You speak to him? Well, that's fine. Now, there's just one more thing, Lightning. 
A long time ago, when I used to give you a bath with just any kind of ordinary soap, what'd you do whenever I got your tub ready? Well, you don't need to have such a sour face about it. I know. You didn't like it. But now that I wash you in Lux Flakes, tell the people how much you enjoy a bath. Fine. <laughs> That's exactly the right answer. No wonder your coat has never shrunk. Okay, Lightning, and thank you all. <laughs> thank you and Lightning both. Once again, Marion Davies, Brian Ahern, and Benita Hume in Pega My Heart. It's early the following morning. And Peg has already announced her intention of returning to Ireland. Her aunt, knowing nothing of the events of last night, realizes that if Peg leaves, the Chichester family will lose the money they receive for her training. In a desperate attempt to keep Peg in the house, she's persuaded Alaric to make a proposal of marriage to her. Alaric, the family martyr, knocks nervously at Peg's door. Oh, I see Margaret. Come in. Uh, hello. What is it, Alaric? <laughs> Here, Micah, stop that. Yes, I'm afraid that dog still doesn't like me. Ah, oh, he's all right. He's smart, too. Uh, I say, Margaret, you're, you're not really going to leave us, are you? I am that. And if you'd excuse me, I think I'll go on with me packing. I see why. Why? Have you seen them on in papers, Alaric? No. Can I get them for you? Oh, no, Alaric. I know what's in them. I say, Pig, there's something I want to tell you. As you know, I, uh, uh, I've grown really uh, awfully fond of you. <laughs> You nearly chalked you, didn't it? And when did you find that out? Well, that just, you were fond of me? Just now, when, uh, when the thought struck me that perhaps you really meant to leave us. Uh, the idea bruises me. Well, does it now? It positively bruises. Ah, you'll get over that. No, I don't think I shall. Uh, do you know, I, I'm going to do something I've never done before in my life. Something useful? Uh, what? <laughs> Certainly not. I'm going to ask a very charming young lady to marry me. Ah, oh, what do you think of that now? <laughs> and who do you think it is? I don't know. Guess. I couldn't guess who'd marry you, Alaric. Oh, it's you. Me? <laughs> oh, Pike. Then, then it's, it's all right. <laughs> it's the most wonderful thing I've ever heard in my life. What? Yes. Oh, yes, yes, of course, good. Fine, splendid. <laughs> yes, of course, there's, uh, there are one or two little things to be settled first. Only one or two? Oh, just little things. In the first place, I must insist on a little obedience. And uh, no Michael. Oh, I couldn't have Michael? No, no. I'm, uh, I'm very firm about that. I'm very, very firm about it, yes. Uh, what could you offer me in this place? What could I offer you in the place of... By myself, of course. Thanks, I'll keep me dog. <laughs> oh, come, I say, you don't really mean that. You don't actually mean that you're refusing me. Could I make it any plainer? I'm refusing you, Alice. Really? Really. Positively? Positively. Oh, I say thanks very much. Oh, goodbye, old girl. What? <laughs> and thanks again. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, cheerio. Emery. Eric, come here. Oh, Mater, Mater, I asked her, and she refused me. Absolutely and positively refused me. I hope you realize how lucky you are. Oh, Mother, please. Oh, I do, I do. But I say, you were the one who put me up to it. Look at this, in the paper. Uh, Mrs. Christopher Brent to sue for divorce. Name's Margaret O'Connor, co-respondent. I say they can't meet Peg. Oh, yes, they can. She was with him last night. Everybody's talking about her, even the servants in the kitchen. It's too bad they can't mind their own business. Ethel, are you preparing to defend her? You who... What is it, Jarvis? This is Gerald, madam. Good morning. You may go, Jarvis. Yes, madam. Good morning. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Eric. I saw a cab at the door. Someone coming or leaving? Someone's leaving, and I, for one, shall be very glad to see a girl. I assume you're talking about Peg. You know very well we are. Have you seen the morning paper? I have. Well? Oh, don't believe it, of course. Don't believe it? You suppose they'd print a thing like this if it weren't true? Well, that's what I'm here to find out. When Peg tells me it's true, I'll believe it. Until then, I prefer to think the papers have made a mistake. Now, where is she? In her room, packing. Oh, she mustn't leave England, of course. She'd lose her inheritance. Well, I'm not going to have her here. It's a mistake ever to let her come to this house. Yes, I'm beginning to think so myself. Oh, I see. I suppose you're going to blame us for what happened last night. I don't know that anything did happen. I'm speaking of other things. You were supposed to make a home for her here, and you were well paid for it. Well, have you done it? Have you done anything except make life miserable for her? How could I make a home for a girl like her? Well, you might have tried. If you had, she wouldn't be going away now. Oh, Peg. Good morning, Jerry. I just came in, Aunt, to say goodbye. Well? Oh, wait a moment. Uh, sit down, Peg. It's late. I'm thinking I'm catching the boat for home. Well, and... you can stay a moment. 
Sit down, Peg. Um, there's a story in the paper this morning about you and Christopher Brent. I thought there would be. I want you to deny it. Did you hear me, Peg? I heard you. Well, you do deny it, don't you? I I only wish I could. Oh, Peg. You oh. know, Ethel, there's nothing I've got to say, nothing. Peg, listen. I don't believe this story. I can't believe it. I know it can't be true. All I want is for you to tell me so. That's all, Peg. I'm not asking for an explanation. I'm not asking for anything except your own word. Well? I've got nothing to say, Jerry. Oh, Peg. Nothing. I'm sorry, Jerry. Well, well, my cab is waiting, and, well, I, I guess that's all. Goodbye, Jerry. Well, Jerry, I hope you're satisfied. No. Get her back. Uh, Call her sorry. back. She lied to you. What's the matter with you? She has nothing to do with it. You hear nothing. Peg. Catch her, catch her there. Ethel. Fainted. Ethel, Ethel, look at me. Get some water, quick. Passengers this way. Show your tickets, please. Will you let me through, please? No more visitors, miss. But I'm not a visitor. I've got a ticket for the boat I have. May I have a seat, please? Oh, glory be. You've got to let me on. It's starting into storm. Well, if you could show your ticket, miss, I... Oh, shut it out, shut it out, shut out the door. Hey, darling, hey. Jerry. Oh, it's you, Jerry. Oh, darling, I, I want to tell you. Hold, Jerry. Hold me, Jerry, hold me. It's all right, Peg, it's all right. It's over now. Oh, Jerry. Sure. And I thought it was a punishment for all my sins that time. For lying about Chris Brent. Oh, Jerry, I, I was hoping that you know the truth, but you're not angry with oh, me. Oh, I couldn't be angry with you. I love you, Peg. Jerry! What? Did you hear what you said? I think so. Did you mean what you said? I'm sure of it. Oh, Jerry, hold me. I, I think I feel another song coming on. Close the pages of tonight's play that bring Marion Davies and Brian Ahern back to you a little later. Where does a young girl live who's come to Hollywood and is trying to make a name in pictures? Some live in little boarding houses, little inexpensive boarding houses. But our most famous residence for such girls, a landmark of the film capital for 21 years, is the Hollywood Studio Club. Maintained by the National YWCA, it's under direct supervision of a group of Hollywood women. Scores of our most prominent stars contribute to its upkeep, and it's sponsored by the Motion Picture Producers Association. Mrs. Arthur S. Heineman, Assistant State Superintendent of Schools, is chairman of the studio club, and Mrs. DeMille, I'm happy to say, is vice chairman of its directing committee, which includes Mrs. James Gleason and Lois Wilson, while Louise Dresser and Mary Pickford are on the advisory committee. But the person to describe what the club is and does is Miss Marjorie Williams, its director for 16 years. Mrs. DeMille tells me, Miss Williams, the club is always filled to capacity, which means that about 100 girls call it home. Of these, who at the moment are making a bid for fame? Well, there's Virginia Walker, for example, a young actress whose portrait occupies an entire page in this month's Esquire. Ida Vollmer and Catherine Aldridge, who appear in The Vogues of 1938, are still with us, and so is Evelyn Keyes, the young Southern girl discovered by Mr. DeMille. Also with us are the secretaries of Eddie Cantor and Myrna Loy, and writers, singers, dancers, script girls, extras, radio actresses, and film cutters. Work in the picture business, you know, is seldom steady. There never was a time when all our girls had jobs, but as a rule, more than half are working at the same time. And who pays the rent when there's no pay envelope coming in? Well, if a girl has exhausted her savings, we do our best to help until she gets a job. Remember, the girls who come to Hollywood are determined to make good. Yet there are hundreds of girls to every job. But still they come. We have them from China, Austria, France, and England. Many of them are from colleges. Many from excellent homes. Some with little or no education. Some with only the prize of a beauty contest. And the good wishes of their friends. 
Some arrived by Pullman coach. A few have hitchhiked. And one girl came as a stowaway by way of the Panama Canal. In 21 years, 3,000 girls have lived at the club. How many of them have attained national fame? Only about 20 or 30, Mr. DeMille, which proves how tremendous are the odds against a newcomer. The one career in which there has been distinct success is marriage. About half of the 3,000 married. And that, after all, is as big and splendid a career as stardom. The wives of Lewis Stone, Marion Cooper, and Jesse Lasky, Jr., all have lived at the club. But getting back to the rent problem, they'll take all kinds of jobs, Mr. DeMille, just to hang on. We have girls singing in nightclubs, one selling insurance. Many have turned typist or business secretary. Some model clothes. And one girl rides an elephant in a circus, still waiting for that chance in pictures. I believe several of the girls have acted in the Lux Radio Theater, haven't they? Yes, they have. This program has many links with the Hollywood Studio Club. Lux is their favorite radio program. And there's no question but that Lux Flakes are their favorite wardrobe care. I don't have to tell you that many girls have moderate income or how important it is to dress smartly to work in pictures. Since many girls do at least part of their washing at the club, we know what kind of soap they use. So it should interest you, Mr. DeMille, as it has interested me, to know that Lux Flakes are by far the most popular. In fact, there's really no comparison. It's so economical and does its job so well. We're glad to know that, Miss Williams. Now can you tell us how a girl's residence club in Hollywood differs from such a club in any other town? It differs to the extent that Hollywood and motion pictures differ from any other place and profession. Every girl here is decidedly an individual. Yet, Hollywood gives them all a oneness of purpose that is a great uniting force. When a girl has had a bad break, when her job hasn't materialized, when her part in the picture gets no further than the floor of the cutting room, she finds a brave sympathy and understanding from her companions. From them, she acquires courage and learns that she can still smile. And to me, that makes Hollywood a far greater place than merely the home of motion pictures. I hope that what I've said tonight will not encourage any girl to come to Hollywood. After 16 years here, there's no better advice I could give than simply this. Unless you are pre prepared financially and otherwise to come to Hollywood as a year's experiment, hang on to your own job, whatever it is, and wait until Hollywood sends for you. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. Thank you, Miss Williams. You. One of the traditions of the Lux Radio Theater is observed at this time, when you meet our stars out of character. A tradition that's never more pleasant than when the stars happen to be Marion Davies and Brian Ahern. It seems few things interest our listeners more, Marion, than news of the current activities of a star. What's she doing and what does she plan to do? So what can you reveal to us about yourself? Only this, Mr. DeMille, that I'm looking forward to doing your picture soon. And I've been reading several manuscripts to find the right one. Recently, Walter Wanger kindly offered me his next color picture. And this month, I was very much flattered to receive an invitation from Mr. George Bernard Shaw to come to London and do the picture Pygmalion. I greatly admire George Bernard Shaw, and I'd love to do Pygmalion. But Warner Brothers have the first claim on my services. Moreover, I used to like the idea of making two or three pictures a year, but now I think that you, Mr. De De I think that you, Mr. DeMille, have the right idea just to make one good picture a year. And it's been awfully delightful returning to the Lux Radio Theater, and I want to thank everyone here on the stage for the marvelous help in making this such a grand evening. Yeah, thank you, Marion. It's been lovely. Thank, thank you. you. A word now from our air-minded leading man, Brian Ahern. A few days ago, the newspapers had Bran in a plane accident at Palm Springs. Oh, it was my plane all right, Mr. DeMille, but I wasn't in it. And are you going to tell us that you weren't in your plane last month when it made that false landing in, <laughs> in Pennsylvania? No, Marion. <laughs> I'm afraid I was very much in it. I thought it might be fun to fly to New York from Hollywood all alone in my open plane, <clears throat> but I had no radio and no landing lights. Well, there came a moment when I miscalculated the change of time and found to my horror that the sun had set behind me when I had counted on another hour of light. I ran into a thick ground mist and spent a very few bad ten minutes wondering just what to do. Then through the trees I managed to spot a dark patch that turned out to be a pasture, and I set the plane down with a few bumps. Well, quite a few people collected, and when I asked where I was, they told me I wasn't very far from Gradyville. Well, I'd never heard of Gradyville, 
But I knew I was only about 20 miles from Philadelphia, so I inquired the way there. The name seemed to stump them all for a while, until finally one bright-minded individual said he guessed that Philadelphia must be somewhere to the other side of Gradyville. And with such specific directions, I found it next, before, next morning and was safely in York Airport an hour later. <laughs> and were you flying to New York to settle details for another stage play this winter? At the time, yes, Mr. DeMille, but I'm working on the Hell Road's picture, Merrily We Live, at the moment, and it seems to look as though I might not make it. About time, learning the art of blind flying, and that's almost exciting enough to compensate for no play this year. Till next time, then, thanks and good night. Good night, Mr. DeMille. Good night, Miss Davies. Good night, Mr. Ahern. Thank you, Miss Davies and Mr. Ahern. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your announcer, Melville Ruiz. There's another outstanding show awaiting you next Monday night, and Mr. DeMille tells you about it in just a moment. Assisting our stars tonight were Edward Broadley as David, Eric Snowden as Christopher Brent, Doris Lloyd as Mrs. Brent, Michael Fitzmorris as Port Officer, Wallace Roberts as Flint, Lou Merrill as Bradley, Frank Nelson as a guard, and Ingborg Tillish and Doris Luray as Irish women. Louis Silvers appeared through courtesy of 20th Century Fox Studios, where he was in charge of music for the new film, Second Honeymoon, and Mr. McDonald through courtesy of Columbia Studios. Now, just before Mr. DeMille returns, we want to remind you that this is the time to help the 1937 drive to fight tuberculosis. Help make the world safer. Purchase your supply of anti-tuberculosis Christmas seals now. Use them on all your Christmas mail. Show that you're helping fight the dread disease, too. Buy seals for Christmas, and you buy help for the new year. And now, Mr. DeMille. Around our microphone next Monday night will be grouped several of Hollywood's most popular performers playing a drama that triumphed on Broadway and became one of Samuel Goldwyn's most successful motion pictures. It was applauded the world over under the title of These Three, a powerful and original drama with a splendid romantic feeling. It stars Barbara Stanwyck, Errol Flynn, Mary Astor, Constance Collier, Alma Kruger, and Marsha May Jones. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Barbara Stanwyck, Errol Flynn, and Mary Astor and an all-star cast in These Three. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.